Well, good morning and happy Easter. Welcome to Grace Church. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. Um, so wherever you are, I'd like to encourage you, let's stand and let's sing together. Your light shines through my darkness, all darkness, like a fire. It consumes all my fears and my failures. Your grace overwhelms like a flood straight from heaven. Your hope opens eyes to the floodgates of heaven. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your word. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels and sing your praise. consider what it means to be an enemy. Um, when I think about an enemy, I think about a few things. Um, I might think about people driving. Um, whenever I get cut off, man, that makes me really upset. Um, or if there's a slow driver in front of you or something like that, you might not have great feelings toward that person. Or maybe in a work environment, um, somebody's being disrespectful or they're talking down to us or um, maybe they're being dishonest to try and get ahead um, in their career. Um, or possibly you're in the grocery store and you're standing six feet behind the person in front of you and somebody else just cuts right in front of you. And you're just like, ugh. And then on top of that, they've got like 100 rolls of toilet paper in their cart. Ugh, insult to injury right there. Um, these are some modern day examples of maybe who we consider our enemy in like a person to person relationship on a global scale. It might be an opposing country that has a viewpoint that we don't agree with, or maybe they're doing something that's, um, not right. And we're trying to fight that battle. Um, now consider this enemy that we have and think about doing something great for them. Um, that driver, uh, maybe buying them new tires or that coworker um, just laying down and letting them take the job promotion or in that grocery store, literally going to the back of the store so everybody can go in front of you. Uh, it's pretty hard to imagine that we would be inclined to do any of those things, 
um, in this passage that I'm about to read elevates that same thought to an even newer height. So um, I'm going to read out of the book of Romans. This is Romans 5, verses uh, 6 through 11. It goes like this. So, um, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In this passage, um, we're learning that while we were enemies with God, while we were at odds with him, while we were um, opposed and hostile to him, he died for us in our place for our sins. Um, And then Paul goes on to say, um, how much more now that we're reconciled, will we be saved by him? The truth of this passage is that even though we were enemies with God, God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. So in that grocery store, not only did he allow the person to go first, but he literally gave his life so that that person can have life. This is great news for us. Um, When we surrender our lives to Christ, when we acknowledge the fact that he is King of King and Lord of Lords, and we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we become reconciled to God, and now we have new life in him. We're no longer enemies with God, but it actually says that we're adopted into his family. So today, Easter Sunday, we get to celebrate the fact that God rose from the grave, that he conquered death. So with these truths in mind, let's continue to praise and glorify his name through singing. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. I'm coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. To the stones moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. 
And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who had come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not near, shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who is resurrected me praise the father praise the son praise the spirit was made as the heavens roared and all hail King King of 
of kings let every tongue confess that he is lord lift up your shout let us join with all of heaven singing Thank you for the sacrifice that you paid, that we can have eternal life through you. King Jesus, you are holy and far above everything and everyone who has ever existed or will ever exist. Lord, thank you that we can know you as our Lord and King and Savior. Amen. Good morning. This morning we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 28 as our scripture reading. This, if you happen to have a Bible from the church, is on page 835. All of the Gospels include an account of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. This is the account in the first Gospel, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. Listen carefully and prayerfully as I read. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as I said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Again, our gracious God and Father, we come into your presence through Jesus. We ask that you would open our minds to understand what we have just read. You would give our brother Paul freedom in his speech and clarity in his speech. And that you would give us both understanding and especially that you would grant to us hearts that long to obey you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us on this special day. A few years ago, I came across a poem that I really like that's called A Psalm for Easter. 
and it was written by a man whose name was Joseph Bailey. And in his short poem, Joseph Bailey suggests that there is one thing that you absolutely have to do on Easter. And it's not collect colored eggs or to throw a honey baked ham in the oven, as good as those things are to do. He says, the one thing that you absolutely have to do on Easter is to laugh. Uh, his poem, again, is called A Psalm for Easter, and it goes like this. He says, let's celebrate Easter with the right of laughter. Christ died and rose and lives. Laugh like a woman who holds her first baby. Our enemy death will soon be destroyed. Laugh like a man who finds out he doesn't have cancer, or that he does, but now there's a cure. Christ, open wide the door of heaven. Laugh like children at Disneyland's gates. The world is owned by God, and he'll return to rule. Laugh like a man who walks away uninjured from a wreck in which his car was totaled. Laugh as if all the people in the whole world were invited to a picnic, and then invite them. Now, it's interesting that this poem would be written by Joseph Bailey. Uh, Joseph also wrote a book about death and dying in 1973, which was called The View from a Hearse. And death was a subject that Bailey was very familiar with. You see, death had stolen from him not only his wife, but also three of his children. His, one of his sons uh, died after surgery when he was 18 days old. And another son died at five years old from leukemia. And then his 18-year-old son passed away in a sledding accident. And yet, when Joseph Bailey wrote about the holiday of Easter, which is a day when families across the world gather together around dinner tables, and for him, a day when the loss of his wife and his three boys would have been so acutely felt and experienced by him, Joseph Bailey suggests that the day of Easter is a day not for tears, but a day for laughter. And today, I want to ask why. What is it about Easter that brought such genuine and heartfelt joy to a man who, in his life, had experienced such sorrow? Well, Joseph actually answers that very question for us in the poem itself. He says that it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the one who, Bailey says, had died and rose and lives. And today we're going to ask the question, is the joy that Joseph Bailey experienced realistic? First of all, did the resurrection of Jesus actually happen? Is it a fact or a fable? And does it require a, a blind leap of faith or is it actually plausible and rooted in credible evidence. And second of all, if the resurrection of Jesus actually did happen, then, then what meaning, what, what purpose, what hope does it offer to you and I today? In other words, why should we laugh like that at Easter? Did the resurrection actually happen? And if so, what does it matter? Well, I want to begin by saying this. And that is that, that the account of the life of Jesus, as it was recorded in the New Testament, is not presented to us as religious mythology. It's not presented as a folk tale or tradition. It's not even presented to us just as fact. Uh, it is presented, I think, even more significantly as something else, and that is news. These accounts were written as eyewitness reports of events that were said to have happened in the public eye. The New Testament books that were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 
were written as eyewitness accounts which were based on the experience not only just of these four men, but of the many witnesses that they interviewed who had seen the things that Jesus had done and had heard the things that Jesus had said. And part of what makes their reporting so credible and convincing in those gospel books is just how public the nature of their reports were. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not just describing in their gospels only the private conversations and experiences and interactions that they had personally had with Jesus. But in many cases, they were recording things that not only they, but many, many other people had experienced together. And here is why that matters so much. If these four men were reporting on events that were said to have happened in public, then the truthfulness of those reports could be either proven or disproven by the eyewitnesses or the lack of eyewitnesses to those reported events. So let me give you an example. For instance, Jesus' first miracle was uh, reported to have occurred during a wedding party in a place called Cana. And what happened was the host had run out of wine at the party and Jesus was asked by his mother to make some more. And, and so he did so using water. He changed water into wine. And we're told that everyone was amazed and that it was the best wine that anybody had ever tasted. Now, when this miracle was recorded in the Bible, the people who had experienced it, the people who were actually at this wedding, would have still been alive. And so if you wanted to know whether or not it was true, all you had to do was just find somebody who attended that wedding party, maybe even the bride or the groom themselves, and, and ask them, did, did Jesus do this or, or didn't he? It, it was a public event, and, and public events can be either proven or disproven by the eyewitnesses to those events. Let me give you another example. Uh, Mark records that in a town called Jericho, Jesus healed a, a blind beggar whose name was Bartimaeus. Now, how many blind beggars named Bartimaeus do you think were living in Jericho at that time? Probably just one. And, and probably most of the people in Jericho knew him and, and, and recognized him, or at least knew of him. Well, it, it wouldn't take a, a prize-winning reporter from the New York Times to investigate whether or not this miracle could have actually happened. A, a kid from a local school newspaper could just go and, and find the guy or find his friends and, and family, anyone who knew him, and ask them, is it true? Was he blind and now can he see? Uh, of the 38 major miracles that Jesus performed, what is so interesting is that not one of them was done in private. And many of them were done in shockingly public ways. Uh, think just for a minute about the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, witnesses claimed that Jesus took a little boy's sack lunch and he served more than 5,000 people with it. And we're off also given the, the details that this occurred on a hillside near the village of Bethsaida, just after the time that John the Baptist was executed. Now, here's the thing. If you are going to make up a fake story that includes a miracle that never actually happened, what you don't do, if you want anyone to believe it, is provide not only the time frame of the miracle and the location, but then suggest that there were actually 5,000 people who were there to witness it. Instead, what you do is you say that this miracle happened in a dark room in a very remote location and that the only people who saw it, if anybody, were a couple of elderly foreigners who have since returned home to their country and conveniently died. Now, the, the greatest miracle of all was the resurrection of Christ. 
That was his greatest miracle. If a person could overcome death itself, if they could rise from the grave, this would be the most historic, supernatural, phenomenal accomplishment of all time. And what I want us to consider is that not only does the Bible make the claim that that actually happened, but the Bible makes the claim that that event happened publicly. The eyewitnesses in the Gospels reported that even though they saw Jesus die, some of them with their own eyes, even though he was publicly crucified on the cross and history attests to that event, they claimed three days later to have seen him risen from the dead. Uh, in the passage that uh, Tom just read for us, we have two of those witnesses mentioned, uh, both of them named Mary. And then we're told right there that Jesus also appeared to his disciples, but there were many other witnesses to Jesus' resurrection as well. In fact, the Bible tells us that the time between when Jesus rose from the grave and ascended to heaven was 40 days. And that during that time, there were 500 people who saw him and, and interacted with him. Uh, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He wrote, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve, those are the twelve disciples, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Now what the Apostle Paul is saying here when he says that these 500 people are still alive is he's saying, go and find them and ask them. Talk to Peter. Talk to the 12 disciples. Talk to any of those 500 people in Jerusalem who are still alive to either confirm or deny that this happened. This was an invitation from the Apostle Paul to investigate the validity of these claims. Uh, Josh McDowell, who is a man that has done a tremendous amount of research and thinking on these things, really drives the point home. He writes, the disciples said that after he was crucified and buried, Jesus was raised from the dead. And for 40 days, not 40 hours, not four days, for 40 days, they lived with him and walked with him with overwhelming proof that he'd been raised from the dead. And the point is, why would they say this if it wasn't true? Why would they suggest that Jesus had seen all of these people over the course of, of 40 days? Why not say that there were only 40 minutes? Why not even 40 seconds? Why 40 days? Well, then we have to ask, well, what about the reliability of these witnesses, though? Well, the number one proof of these of their reliability is the fact that they were persecuted for making this claim. This claim. Many believers were tortured and beheaded and fed to lions because they refused to retract the claim that they had actually seen the risen Jesus. The reason that we can trust that these witnesses were reliable is because people do not die for a hoax. People don't die for a lie that they've made up themselves. Uh, again, here's what Josh McDowell says about this. He writes, If the resurrection was a lie, they had to know it. And if they knew it, then you'd have to say, Here were these men who not only died for a lie, but they knew it was a lie. I challenge you to find others in history who that's true of. It's not. People don't die for a lie. 
Well, I have really just scratched the surface here in some of the evidence that we have that, that the resurrection actually happened. That, that believing in the resurrection does not just require a blind leap of faith, but that there are deeply compelling reasons to believe that it actually is true. But if the resurrection is credible, the next question we have to ask ourselves is, then, then what does it mean? Why does the resurrection matter? And I want to suggest that one of the reasons why the resurrection matters so much is that Jesus made some very particular claims about himself and that the validity of these claims are intricately tied to the resurrection. His claims and whether or not the resurrection actually happened are connected with one another. So let me share with you just five of these particular claims that Jesus made. First of all, Jesus claimed to be God. Uh, John, in John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And Jesus there was asserting that he was unique. He was he was claiming that he lived in perfect relationship with God the Father and that, in fact, he possessed all of the majesty and power and perfect attributes of God. Jesus was claiming to be more than just a mere man. He was claiming to be divine. And yet, in spite of his deity, Jesus also claimed that something terrible and then something wonderful was about to happen to him in the future. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 22, Jesus said, The Son of Man, and he's referring to himself as he uh, shares that name, he says, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. Now, this was a very bold and specific claim of Jesus. He is saying in advance that he would be arrested and then killed, and then exactly three days later, he would rise again. What Jesus was doing there is he was predicting both his death on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter Sunday. And then he made a third claim that kind of sheds a little bit more light on that second one. In John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And what this meant was that Jesus' death would not be an accident or a failure or some sort of cosmic mistake or defeat but quite the opposite. Instead, Jesus' death would be a choice that he was purposefully making. He said that he would knowingly lay down his life, just like a, a shepherd who dies in the service of protecting his sheep from the attack of a wolf. In the same way, Jesus' death would be in, in, in the service of shielding his people from harm. And then he made a fourth claim in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He said these words, For I came not to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom for many. And here Jesus came to the heart of the cross. That word that he used, ransom, is very significant. A ransom is a substitute. Uh, uh, one thing is substituted for another. You've uh, probably seen a movie before where a bad guy takes some hostages in a bank. And, and then later on in the movie, those hostages are traded or substituted for a million dollars. The million dollars is the ransom for their lives. Uh, or, or maybe in the movie, in, instead of a million dollars, there's a, a very brave FBI agent who offers to, to trade or to substitute himself for those hostages. And in that case, the FBI agent himself is the ransom. 
Well, the Bible teaches that human beings are in a very similar situation, that, that we are in, in many ways like hostages, that, that every one of us has gotten ourselves into a terrible mess, and it is our sin, it's all the ways that we fall short of what God intends for us that have gotten us into that mess. Uh, in the Bible, our sin is not just all of the wrong things that we've done, even though all of those things are included, but it's also the right things that we should have done, but we didn't do. It, it, it's all the ways in life that we neglect to love God and to love the people who are around us. And so the Bible says that the, the bad news is that the wages of sin, the result of our sin, is death, e eternal separation from God. Death is the price that every sinner must pay eventually for their sin. And because of this, it's like death has a claim on every sinner. It's like we are the prisoners of death itself, trapped in its grasp like hostages. But what Jesus was claiming here was that since he was God himself. He had not only the ability, but the sacrificial love in his heart that would be required, like a good shepherd, to lay his life down and substitute himself for us to be our ransom. Like that FBI agent, Jesus would hand himself over for us to death so that we could be set free from it. He would die in our place for our sins so that we don't have to. For I came not to be served, he said. I didn't come so that you could do something for me, Jesus said. He says, I came to serve you and to give my life as a ransom for many. What a claim he was making. And then he made an even bigger claim. In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Those who believe in Jesus, he was saying, and trust him to be their ransom, Jesus claimed those people will never die because he has already died on their behalf. He has already made their ransom payment to death. He has taken in his chest the bullet that was aimed at theirs, so that now they are set free from the inevitability of death, so that they can experience eternal life with God. Now, those were Jesus' claims. Those are the things that he said he would do and the question becomes, this is the, the, the key question in all of life, can we believe him? Did Jesus have the power to do that? How do we know that those were not just empty words that anyone could have said? How do we know in our hearts that Jesus accomplished all of that? And the answer to that question is the resurrection. The resurrection is what gives us the evidence that we need to make Jesus' claims believable. And I want you to follow my logic here for just a minute. If the resurrection actually happened, if Jesus really did rise again from the grave, if he could do that, then what that proves is that he actually is who he claimed to be, God himself. 
because only God himself could rise from the dead. No ordinary person could ever do that. And if Jesus actually was God, then he actually does, being God, have the power to accomplish everything else that he claimed that he could do, in particular, freeing us from the penalty of sin and releasing us from the certainty of death. But if he didn't rise from the grave, then what that means is that he wasn't telling the truth, that his claims were all lies, or he was just crazy. Either way, he wasn't God, and therefore we are still the hostages of death. We are not free. No one has paid our ransom, and some day we will need to pay it ourselves. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if the resurrection did not happen, then our faith is in vain. And if our faith is in vain, he says, then we are without hope. But if Jesus could raise himself from death, if he could free himself from the grave, then he certainly must have the power to free us too. Jesus' defeat of death, if it happened, paves the way for ours. Let me give you a, an example of this. I want you to imagine for just a minute that there are two young children at a water park, uh, a boy and his younger sister, and they're climbing up the stairs, getting ready to go on the, the tallest, biggest, scariest uh, water slide they've ever seen in their lives. But on, on the way up, they're both feeling very, very brave, and they're talking about how awesome it's gonna be, and they've been waiting all of their lives for this. But when they finally get to the top, and they look down in, into this long, steep, dark tunnel that's filled with rushing water and a deep, deep pool at the bottom of it, they are absolutely terrified. And so the older brother, he, he, he turns to his sister and, and he says, ladies first. And she says, no way, I'm not going first. We're gonna die, we're going to die. And then just at that moment, there's a, there's a teenager in line behind them who's growing more and more impatient and, and he jumps in front of them and he dives headfirst down the slide and the two children are amazed and, and they run over to the side and, and they stare intently to the end of the slide and, and wait where, where the slide empties into the pool and they're watching and just waiting to see what happens and it, it feels like an eternity. And then suddenly with this huge splash, the teenager is flung into the pool underwater and, and, and then the two kids who are standing at the top, they, they finally see coming out of the water these two hands in the air that are raised in victory and the teenage boy jumps up out at the water from the water and, and he looks up at them and he yells, you see, you don't have to be afraid. Just look at me, I did it. And in many ways, what I'm trying to say is that that is exactly what Jesus says to us. That those who trust him do not need to fear death because Jesus has shown us that death can be defeated. He, he's gone ahead of us to face death for us as our ransom. And because he came out victoriously on the other side, risen from the dead, we can have confidence in him that we will rise too. Everything hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's how Joseph Bailey, who lost his wife and his son and another son and another son 
as he sat at the family table on Easter Sunday with all of those empty seats. It's how he could say, let's celebrate Easter with the rite of laughter. Christ died and rose and lives. Laugh like a woman who holds her first baby. Our enemy, death, will soon be destroyed. Laugh like a man who finds he doesn't have cancer or does, but now there's a cure. Christ opened wide the door of heaven. Laugh like children at Disneyland's gates. The world is owned by God and he'll return to rule. Laugh like a man who walks away uninjured from a wreck in which his car was totaled. Laugh as if all the people in the whole world were invited to a picnic and then invite them. And this morning, I want you to know that you are invited to that picnic. You are invited by God to experience the joy, the relief, the hope, and the laughter of the resurrection through Jesus Christ. And that is why Easter matters. Let's pray together. Father, I want to pray this morning as David himself prayed in the psalm and just join him in heart. He prayed in Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon the rock. Father, this morning I want to thank you that we can pray a prayer like that with confidence. Even in these uncertain, difficult times where all of us are dealing with all kinds of different anxieties, we thank you that it was Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection which for us secures our eternity. Father, it is the hope for us who believe that in the end everything is going to turn out okay. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you that he had the heart to lay down his life for us. Thank you that he had the power so that in laying down his life, we could gain life even as he took for us our death. And Father, I, I pray that you would help us as we reflect on these things and trust in these things and, and, and ask you to give us faith to have confidence in these things that in our heart, in the face of everything that we may be facing, that we would find laughter, that we would find joy, that we would find peace, that we would find hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be gracious to me, Father. According to your faithful love, 
Turn your face from my rebellion Completely wash away my guilt
Well, uh, this week I was able to communicate with each of our workers that are in the Balkans, the three families that we support in church planting efforts there, and to uh, find how they were doing and to know that they're in exactly the same condition that we're in. The same situation where they're, for the most part, confined to their homes with their families and they're having to do services uh, by some sort of video. And uh, that gives us, I guess, a sense of solidarity we don't always have with people that are far away and live a very different kind of life. But I want you for a moment as we meet together here to think beyond our present circumstances to whenever this will end and we will again be free to circulate, free to work, free to go to school and do all the things that our busy lives demand. We look forward to that time, the time when we will be able to meet together as a church. But the needs of ministry are, are also illustrated in the fact that I was able to speak with each of those families. Each of them, in varying degrees, uh, are dependent on what we give to them as well as the giving of other people to sustain the ministry that they're performing in the Balkan region. And that's true for our own staff here, for the ministries that we have going on, even though things obviously cut back and they slow down, we have needs. And so we're trusting that while our situation is very different than it has been usually, that you will take the opportunity to continue to give as you are able to the work of God. Why don't we pray together about that? Again, our gracious God and Father, we thank you that you supply us richly with all things. We have that confidence either even in times of uncertainty when we uh, have either lost jobs or we're laid off from our job or our income is very uncertain. We pray that you would allow us, as we are able, to continue to participate in your work, to show to you our gratitude for your great redemption by taking a small portion of what you've given to us and uh, acknowledging that in reality it all belongs to you, and we acknowledge that by giving a small portion of it. We trust that you will enable us to do that and you will sustain your people and your church in many different parts of this country and of the whole world through this that we are now experiencing. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again so much for joining us today on Easter Sunday. I just wanted to make you aware of two things before we close. Uh, the first is that this Wednesday, April 15th, at 7 o'clock in the evening, we are going to have something together online called Elder-Led Prayer. Uh, we will be gathering whoever is available to do so on a platform called Zoom, and our elders will be leading us in a time of singing, a little bit of teaching, and an opportunity for us to pray together for many of the needs that are happening in the world around us right now. If you're interested in participating, all that you need to do is just send an email to info at gracechurchinfo.net and, and let us know that you'd like to participate. We will send you some information of how you can install Zoom and log on uh, that evening. It's very, very simple, and I don't think that you'll have a problem doing that, but we would love to have you participate, and it will be a great chance for all of us to see some people online that we haven't had the chance to interact with in, in weeks. I'm really looking forward to it. The second thing is I wanted to let you know that we will be beginning a new series next Sunday online called Base Camp. And uh, this uh, series will be a great opportunity for us to consider some of the foundational principles that the Bible teaches are, are true. We'll look at some of the great work that God has accomplished and uh, seek to apply that to our lives. And here's a little trailer that you can watch which will uh, prepare you for that series.
Well, why don't we close with the doxology from the book of Jude on this Easter Sunday morning. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.